Welcome to the Thoughtful Software Podcast with your hosts, Andrew Wolf and Fahad Shokat. Thoughtful Software is a set of values, principles, and techniques to fuel digital innovation. We want to help usher in a new approach to the way software is imagined, designed, and built. The hot topic for several years now has been digital transformation. Today, remote transformation has become essential for every company. There is little doubt now that employees only have to be in the office for work. However, going remote goes beyond installing Slack and Zoom. Going remote requires companies to transition from approval-based workflows to audit-based workflows. In this episode, Andrew and Fahad discuss new workflows and what it means to be a remote company. Listen in as they discuss how remote is eating the world. Don't let it eat you. We hope you enjoy. All right, okay, Andrew. We haven't done an episode, just me and you, in quite some time, so it's good to chat again. And uh, we're in the midst of this uh, COVID crisis, uh, which has forced the entire world to go remote, which is crazy. And we started to discuss how this is going to change the world. And you had some interesting thoughts on how remote is eating the world and how everyone will not have to just go through digital transformation, but remote transformation. And you heard it here first. We're hashtagging remote transformation. Uh, And it's not what you think. It's not all about Zoom and Slack. It goes much, much deeper. And so that's the focus of our discussion today. So let's set the stage. You know, remote work has been around for a long time. And the transition with COVID, where the entire world has gone remote, is probably the fastest transition in history, probably. So why do you say remote is eating the world? I mean, look at every major economy in the world. I mean, the government has shut them down. Whether you're Italy, Germany, Great Britain, United States, China, Japan, everybody is working remote. Uh, it's, there's nobody going into the office right now except for essential workers. And that means that the world is remote. And anyone that can work remotely has been told to work remotely. A lot of people that have the privilege to do it are doing it. So major corporations, whether you're a small boutique firm or you're one of the large the Apple, right? You're doing your work from your house. And we've it's effectively means every professional pretty much is working from their home and remotely. So you said remote is eating the world. So once you eat something, right, you can't go back. <laughs> Are we ever going to go back to times before? I mean, think about it. As a manager, are you going to be able to go tell your people who've been working remotely for how who knows how long, uh, 30 days in a lot of cases at the moment, but it's probably going to be closer to 90 days uh, based on all the numbers. You may tell your employee who's been doing great work remotely for 90 days that they can't work remotely anymore. And are you going to have any credibility when you say that to your employees? And I just don't think you're going to. And so therefore, I think most companies are going to be forced with the fact to tell people, hey, You know, we do like you in the office. We think it's better for collaboration or whatever bullshit reason you give them. They're going to be like, well, I want to work from home two, three days a week. And you're going to probably see a mixed mode at start. But I I can't imagine when you look at where you can cut costs if you're an effective and efficient business that, you know, you're not spending millions of dollars on real estate that you don't say, oof, I could save them a million dollars not having all these offices. It's just going to make sense over time. Just curious, like a sidebar, what's, what's your thought on commercial real estate now? Because I think it's going to take a huge hit, right? I mean, I, companies won't have to expand as much anymore. Uh, I haven't written about it, but I think this is the best thing that could have possibly happened to WeWork ever. And uh, basically, who's going to lease a building when, you know, um, one, you can be told not to use your building anymore. And two, when you can pay a little bit extra and not have the liability on the books, I think places like WeWork that have short-term space for people to use are going to become more and more common and the overall commercial real estate will go down. I mean, there are some things that require physical presence. You're not going to be able to remotely cut hair anytime soon or uh, any of that. So there's restaurants, things like that. So commercial real estate isn't going to tank overnight. It's not going to go from 100 to zero. But I think you're going to see a substantial decrease in the number of people leasing and Uh, potentially purchasing commercial real estate over the next five to six years. Yeah, it's interesting. I I thought uh, WeWork would, you know, I I thought they're just on the, you know, slow death, but it seems like this this might save them. You're right. Why would you want to sign a 
you know, 10 year lease, 15 year lease when you don't have to. Yep, correct. And I don't know if this saves WeWork, but a company like WeWork will probably come and be born from this. Uh, people not wanting to take on the liability of having real estate. Um, the open office scheme and everything else in WeWork isn't ideal for companies, but there will be some sort of new mechanism created to offset the risk of and support remote work. Um, so it'll be very interesting. Uh, so we're set up remote first. You know, Skipless was born remote. And um, what are your thoughts on how a company that it's remote first or born remote, uh, w- what's our advantage now? It's ma- I mean, it's always been massive. If you c- can only hire people in, let's say you have a your, your terrific company, you have offices in New York City, uh, San Francisco, LA, uh, Chicago, Nashville, you, you've ter- you have great offices in those areas, uh, but you're hiring only on-premise people. Um, one, you know, these that all those cities have great people in them. There's no doubt, but those aren't essentially located where everybody's at. Only the smart people live there. There's a lot of people that live elsewhere that you lose that you don't get access to by hiring there. So one, we've always had a talent advantage because we can hire wherever we want, wherever we're legally allowed to operate. Um, And that's that's a huge strategic advantage for us. But the other advantages we get of uh, getting people's best work, those are being realized now too, right? Uh, People don't just work nine to five because you ask them to. Um, how many hours are lost every day? Because people are not their most productive during those hours. If someone's productive from 8 p.m. to 12 o'clock and they're extremely productive, why would you stop someone from doing that? But office culture prevents you from saying that person can come in from 8 p.m. to 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. and work. Uh, but a remote place allows you to do that. And I think we've been getting the best work and the best talent from anywhere. Uh, and that's always been our strategic advantage over everybody else. I mean, is it really hard for big companies to have like this mental shift uh, where, you know, you can find talent anywhere and you don't have to be in the office? Is this really hard for big companies to do that? Absolutely. I I think, uh, so we look at how big companies are structured. Um, I think you have to look at that first to understand why remote is so hard for them. Most companies are structured in a hierarchy, you know, Um, I report to a manager, my manager reports to a manager who manages managers, that manager reports to a manager up to the CEO. And then the CEO even reports to a group of managers called the board of directors. And so hierarchy is super great for consistent results. And so if you're a big company with a proven product, the best thing you can do is execute reliably and consistently, right? So if you have product market fit, all of that stuff. So you want a hierarchy, but to work remotely, you know, hierarchies also require you to basically have an approval workflow. You know, a manager can approve this much, a director can approve this much, a VP, and you have all these approvals, but to work remotely and have a distributed team that can get results, you need to move towards a flatter structure. And to move towards a flatter structure and organization is actually the opposite of how big companies are operating today right? With their approval workflow. So you need to move from an approval mindset to an audit-based mindset. You need to move from, uh, you know, stopping cross-team communication to embracing cross-team communication. Uh, You need to move towards uh, preventing collaboration to extreme amount of collaboration. But when you're there, you're unlocking the best of your people who come in and they want to achieve your mission and they're producing their best work. And therefore, you do get consistent results and your results are actually better in the long run because people are more empowered to do what's right for your customers and your the people buying your product. Yeah, yeah, we'll touch on, on those three things. I think those were uh, important uh, aspects about remote transformation that we'll cover. Uh, but what will happen to companies that don't fully adopt a remote culture? Uh, a lot of these big companies do have, you know, big uh bank accounts and some of these startups are well-funded uh, or, you know, companies generally are just working in the traditional sense, but w- what do you think slowly or even s- sooner might happen to them if they don't adopt this new transformation? Uh, y- let me remind everybody that Yahoo is well-funded too. And then Google really came in and kicked them in the face. So I, you know, well-funded doesn't mean anything to in these, in this world, unless you're like, I guess a physical good, And then manufacturing costs and stuff, you do get a slight competitive advantage. But 
I believe that what happens to these companies is that you end up with brain drain. You know, uh, people that want to have that freedom to work when they want to work, to work the way they want to work, to work the, uh, how they want to work, they're going to lead to the company to do embrace remote. And not only are they stealing your talent, they're getting access to talent that you can't even think about because you don't have an office in Wichita, Kansas or Cleveland, Ohio. You don't have access to these people. And so not only are you losing your own talent, they're getting talent that you don't have. And so they're going to build a huge talent advantage against you. They're going to out-execute you. And then maybe they don't put you out of business, but you're not the market leader anymore, right? You're not even number two, right? Because they're going to embrace it. And by the time that you get around to embracing it, they've already figured it out how to do it. And so they're 10 years ahead of you. They're building new products and they're building their advantage over you. And that's going to really kill the major companies that don't embrace this opportunity to uh, change their culture and change the way they operate. From at a global sense, everyone's remote. Then you know you have places like Ohio where you are. I mean, you have a wonderful house by the lake, and somebody who is now in a tiny apartment in San Francisco will have the option to say, hey, you know, I want to go back to the Midwest or uh, go anywhere, and and the company might be just fine with that. So yeah, that's totally okay with us. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at, I mean, there's been tons of transformations like this uh, throughout history. I'm not being hyperbolic when I say this. If you go look at uh, uh, DuPont, the consulting company in the 70s, invented the departmental system for companies, look at the companies that adopted the departmental system and the ones that didn't. And I'll tell you, find me a corporation that have departments that exist today. I'll wait, you won't find it because everyone adopted it and the ones that didn't got put out of business. And that's exactly what's gonna happen here. It might not be tomorrow, You might be safe in the next two or three years, but five or six years from now, you're not going to be around. You're going to be very much hurting and you're going to go the way of any old fashioned business. You have a lot of IP. You might get bought by a private equity firm who then, you know, guts you and then steals all the profits and then shuts you down. But you're not going to be something people talk about. You're going to be another what if scenario, a radio shack, a Toys R Us. You're not going to be one of those companies that that is around for a long time. Yeah, it allows you to be more nimble. I mean, I personally love remote work. You know, you get that time to focus, you know, without distractions. You know, Cal Newport is a famous author, has been talking about deep work. So I I personally think now that everybody is gonna be, is, is kind of in the same boat, uh, it'll be a, a definitely a new norm. Yep. Uh, but let's talk about remote transformation. That's, that's the heart of this uh, topic going beyond Slack and Zoom, you know, that's that's just turning on a collaboration tool, which is great. Uh, but it goes much, much deeper than that. First, organizations must move from an approval-based workflow to an audit-based for- workflow. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, so the right now, if you look at it, let's talk about sales quotas, uh, quoting, not quotas. We talk about sales quotas too, actually. That's a really interesting part, but we're talking about quoting. So quoting, when a salesperson makes a quote, Let's say they're approved to make 5% discounts, okay? So you walk out of your customer's you know, pitch, you go to your manager and say, boy, they'll buy by any 15% discount. It takes two or three days for your manager to get back to you. They say, oh, you can give it 12.5%. That's an approval-based workflow. But what if the salesperson was empowered to be audited? Meaning we're going to look at all your deals, and if you're doing too much, you're not going to have your job, or we're going to hit your, you know, towards your quota. We're going to hit towards your potentially your commission. Instead, they were empowered to help the customer. And on site, while they're pitching, the customer says, "Ooh, you know, that cost. You know, we ran the numbers you gave us per license, and it's going to cost us a million and a half, but we have 1.1 million. What if the salesperson is empowered right there to say, "I can do 1.1 million," and get that deal done? before the customer has a chance to walk away and rethink whether they want to buy your solution. And that's an an audit-based workflow. Eventually, that deal is going to get through the system and managers are going to be able to look at it and say, 1.1 million, that's a 30% discount. What are you doing? But the salesperson has come back like, or we would have lost the deal. And by empowering the person to make the approval, that person can now have the autonomy to help your customers to do what they needed to do um, at that moment, instead of having to wait for a manager to approve their action. Fahad, how many times have you called into a, a support line and that person said, wait, I have to talk to my manager? How frustrating is that? 
to sit on hold yeah. for five or six minutes while that person, which should just be like resetting your password or something, five or six minutes to get approval from a manager. How much better would it be if the person was like, yeah, I reset your password, you're good to go, enter that into a system, and then you want about a day. Not only did you get better service, you're more delighted, and that, that experience is going to stick out in your mind. And as a distributed company, it's super important that you empower your people and you trust them to be able to make those decisions. And then later, you know, you can reconcile it. And if there needs to be action taken, you can. Or you find out that your people really know how to take care of your customers and really know how to do everything they need to do. One big point you're touching on, and as you and I know very personally, that there are a lot of bad actors out there and or people that are not just good at what they do. And what you're describing here is centered around a lot of trust with that person and empowering them to make those specific decisions. What's your thought about like the companies who have never done this before? They've always been on an approval based system or workflow, and now it's more audit based. There's this huge trust component in there. So how do you foster more trust? I think you, one, you boost your interview process. You start weeding out people and that's a boon to the company. If your interview process is better, you stop focusing on quantity of hires and you focus on quality of hires. I think that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is that you, uh, you do have a very low audit cycle, right? So you don't start with like, letting people have the leash of five days without knowing what they did. You can start with one or two days. You know, uh, great companies like Bridgewater Capital have you send an update to your manager every day of what you did. They're trading billions of dollars a day in volume. And so you only can go about a day before a manager realizes you did something terrible because you have to send them an update. And so they're short leash, but a lot of latitude during that day to you know, do damage. And if you look at the companies that actually perform the best, you'll find that they actually have quite a bit of latitude, um, but they have great checks and balances in the system to prevent bad actors and things like that. I'm not saying that people should be able to do whatever the hell they want, no matter what. I'm not saying that. I, what I am saying, though, is people should have the latitude to do their job. If their job is customer success, you can limit them in that circle of just being able to help customers, but they should be able to be empowered to make those customers succeed in whatever ways is relevant to your company. Yeah, I mean, it's, and trust goes both ways, right? So you trust the employee, but they also trust you that there's a environment which fosters, you know, learning. I mean, Bridgewater, you bring up an example. Um, Ray Daly describes how one of his employees lost a ton of money on a transaction and he made a terrible mistake. And instead of firing him, it was a learning moment. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of like cultural things there that you need to you know, from a trust perspective that, yeah, you know, this is, we're going to help you learn um, and get through this and, and keep iterating and making it better and better. A hundred percent. And then on top of that, think about this way. When I worked at a large corporation, that was my full-time job, maybe 10 years ago, I literally couldn't install software on my computer as a software developer. If I needed a package installed, I had to open a ticket. It'd take 48 hours for to get me that software I needed, which was 48 hours longer then it would have taken me to actually write the two lines of code I need to do. And that process would literally add days and weeks into our development cycle. And we would always up, mark up all of our development. In fact, a lot of things we did, we had a 3x buffer to it because of problems like that. If I was empowered to just install the software I needed to do, I would have got 3x more work done. Fahad. And that's not just me, that's across the company. Imagine how much more productive these corporations could be if they didn't have these inhibitive prop, uh, processes that prevent people from doing their jobs. And I'm not the, I wasn't the only one. I was a software developer. I had uh, elevated privileges on my computer. Other people literally couldn't even install Zoom or clients like that on it. So they couldn't even work with outside people that needed them to like have a type of collaboration tool on their computers. Okay, we'll talk about collaboration in a second. But so the, another aspect that is key to success uh, in, in this remote environment uh, that you talk about is not enforcing work hours and shifting to more of a like results-based mentality. Uh, how would an organization make a shift to a results-based mentality? What, what specifically changes? So I think the first thing is becoming a measure-first company. 
right? What are you trying to achieve, right? So you set your mission, right? And your mission isn't some stupid phrase like innovation first or something terrible like that. It's about saying, what is our mission? What are we trying to achieve in this world? And from there, setting objectives that help you meet that mission. And then measuring against those objectives within your company, across all the departments, across all the teams of those key results that are needed to achieve those objectives and consistently measuring those and asking yourself, will this help achieve that objective or will it not help achieve that objective? And it doesn't. Why are you doing it? You're not helping achieve the objective. It's a waste of time and throwing anything out that doesn't help achieve those objectives. So you want to always be measuring to make sure every action taken is purposeful and against that mission and against that objective. That's the first thing you need to do. The second thing you need to do is understand that sometimes results are lagging indicators and leading indicators, right? So if someone is only working an hour a day, that's actually a leading indicator to the fact that your result might not be achieved. But it's not actually a truism until your result isn't achieved, right? And so you can look at your leading indicators and figure out whether you're going to achieve your result or not and adjust thusly. But again, you're still focused on the result and not necessarily the the immediate actions that might get that result. I think the last thing you need to do culturally to get towards a result mentality is constantly be looking at how you're trending and making course corrections, which means like there's a common term being agile, right? So if you're constantly looking at the numbers and you're being numbers first, and you're constantly looking at the actions, you should be able to course correct the actions to get through the results. And you say, listen, we have three weeks to achieve this goal. We need to start doing more of this and less of that. And that lets you fine tune to get your results. If you do those things, if you consistently iterate, you consistently observe, and you consistently make changes, you will get to a results-based mentality. Again, because you're fine that like, okay, someone worked 20 hours this week or whatever, like the common ass and seat mentality, right? They didn't show up at the office, but we achieved a result, right? You're fine that you'll achieve your results. And then on top of that, it's a form of empowerment for people. It gives them focus and allows them to make good decisions by being results-based. They know what result needs to happen for them to be successful. And therefore, they always try to take action towards that result. And that means people can actually do their job. Uh, And it's, I find companies that do this are magnitudes more successful than the other ones. The companies that don't, they tend not to be around very often. A lot of companies do this in a lot of different forms, but the objectives and key results, OKRs, what they're called, is a great framework for companies to execute. And a lot of tech companies that perform really well are using this model. It also forces a lot of accountability, right? I mean, even if you can do a job in 20 hours, uh, you still have some time in the week to pick up other tasks and help your colleagues rather than just, you know, kind of goof around for the, the other 20. So, I mean, overall, it, it should strengthen the culture and, and strengthen the bond you have with your, you know, coworkers. It builds trust. If everybody knows, yeah. uh, the thing that's interesting about like people is the tribal. And the reason people are tribal is they all feel they, uh, like by tribe has a shared vision. A vision could be survival, it could be whatever, but being part of that tribe also means that we're all looking at the same result. And by having these same results, teams are able to galvanize around it. And they're able to say, well, I can trust this person because they want the same result I want. And it builds trust among everyone else because we all know we're working towards the same objective and the same mission. Oh, that's interesting. So, all right, let's talk about the last aspect um, that you've mentioned before uh, is around moving applications away from like a centralized decision-making power to more collaborative tools. And we've mentioned them here, Zoom, Slack, Teams, things like Figma. How does remote work and these tools actually speed up collaboration if you know companies aren't fully uh, bought into more like web-based, browser-based type tools, cloud-based tools? So there's two things. If you don't make the cultural shifts, they don't help you at all. Um, you know, Zoom's great, but if I can't create my own Zoom link because I need approval from a manager to create an outside meeting, Zoom didn't help you at all. Like it just created another item of work for your managers to do. Uh, so you do have to change your culture for these tools to help. And the way you change your culture is going to uh, pretty much denote how much 
that tool is going to help you. On the other side, how they can help you, uh, how web-based tools are better, how empowering is it for me to say, I need to meet with this client, create a Zoom link, send it to my client, and be speaking to them within two or three minutes? How empowering is it for me to have Figma and be able to share it with my customer and say, what do you think of this design? Is it great? Is it what you need? And have those real conversations on something concrete like a design. How empowering is it to say, I need something from Fahad, reach out directly to Fahad, say, hey, I got a question, man. Can you do this for me or whatever and have that real conversation? Or if I need to get a group of people together, be able to create a group DM and make that happen, right? Instead of having to book a conference room, meet for 30 minutes on Tuesday and wait four days to get my immediate response. These are all things that empower people to achieve your objectives. And the more you do that, the more I allow information and collaboration and all these amazing things, that's when you get really excellent results. Uh, and the, these tools, Slack, Zoom, all the things we mentioned, they help with that. They assist in some form of making sure that people can share information and share knowledge and share insights to deliver better results. So be, besides, you know, being together and, you know, having a drink or meeting face to face, what are some of the downsides, you know, if you're just fully remote all the time? Well, uh, definitely Definitely socialization is hard. It's much harder. You know, if you're used to getting meeting, talking to 30 people a day at the office, it's difficult to adjust. Um, some other downsides is, you know, as you hire people, the hiring process will be a little more stricter. You have to be able to trust people without meeting them, potentially. Um, you have to be able to trust that they have the same vision as you do and just talking to them and not seeing their body language. Uh some other things that are really difficult is hard, you know, if you're a manager that's always seen your people work by walking over to the desk and poking them on the shoulder, you can't do that anymore. And so you have to change your mindset and how you're managing people. So management becomes a little more difficult. I'd love to see in a movie like The Office Space done virtually. That would be a pretty funny movie. It would be so Just, great. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no. Um, I think the last thing that's really difficult with remote work is understanding that people are going to have things and letting people integrate their life and their work together. And it, historically, but COVID's made this better, people weren't used to people's kids being on calls. But if they're working remotely, of course, that's going to be a thing. And just because their kids are home doesn't mean they're not working. That just means that, you know, you know, their kids are probably on their iPads a little more than they should be, but it's all good. Right. That is it is what it is. I think we have to get used to that people's life and their work isn't so different. I mean, we're all trying to get by, we're all trying to build something amazing and understanding that kids are a part of someone's life and animals and all these other things that used to not be a part of it, but now are. But I also think that it's a boon, right? I think it's also a boon for companies to support those things and take help people take care of their entire life and not just their work life. That's a really interesting thought because I think this is one of those unspoken uh, things that come up when hiring, whether they have like young kids and how they're going to manage their schedule and all uh, they're busy, uh, you know, working moms, you've read about how, you know, sometimes colleagues don't quite understand, but it turns out, you know, yeah, you can still get stuff done. And uh, quite often, People who do have kids or have a busy schedule are very focused and can work, and but it'll be quite acceptable. So, like, this is not going to be a thing to be concerned about. Like, uh, well, you know, they have kids. You know, or should we consider someone else? It'll be just like again, results based. Like, this person has delivered consistently. We need this type of person. You know, it's really interesting. But in my career and as a hiring manager now, the hiring manager, I. I've met very few people that work harder than a, a, a working mom. Um, they come into work and they don't fuck around because they don't have time to fuck around, right? The, all those erroneous Slack messages, those memes, they're not doing them. They're working extremely hard because they know they have limited time to get good results. Uh, and I think that's becoming more and more true across the board for everybody. People are realizing, hey, if I just work really hard and I don't have ping pong tables and Xbox and all these things that are distracting me for four hours a day, I really can fit my work into six to eight hours and I can take time to walk my dog and look how great this is. And I think 
Uh, I had a term for it called fuck around itis. And I think that's really killing it. I think this is the cure for it of knowing that, hey, if I do my work job and I work hard and I'm not distracted, I get plenty of time to take care of myself and my family and all of that stuff. And I think remote work just empowers people to do that even more. And uh, it's a game changer. Eight hours of hard work is a lot of work, especially with the productivity tools we have uh, in today's world. You can get a hell of a lot done in eight hours. And with that, I think it's, it's just, we're going to see a whole different level of productivity going forward. And if you're not remote, you're going to lose out, out on that level of productivity. Yeah, man, don't get me started on open offices because I've been in, in that environment. 90% of the people were not putting in a full days of work, maybe even half day. I'd be surprised. So I'm, I'm happy for this kind of remote transformation. So as a final thought, um, I personally believe that many of the jobs and the ways of working, they're just not coming back. I don't think people quite realize that they're, you know, remote is the new norm, but there's also a lot of jobs that are just not coming back. You know, and the offices will be like basically for in-person collaboration, maybe it'll be optional to come. Uh, but from our perspective, like consulting and software development, uh, what do you see changing and how software will be built? I think the way collaboration for software is going to be the next wave of software. Um, people not investing in making their software more collaborative. And I don't mean uh, going and uh, making SAP. I mean, ground up collaboration built into software is going to be the absolute future. And if people can't go there, if people don't do that, their software is going to get eaten by software that does. And it's it's a real, it's a mind shift if you're a developer to be able to do that. And the, the paradigm of how you develop it, which features go first? Do we add chat to our application? Do we add integrations into our application? All of that is going to become key in the way products product people think and the way engineers design and build and architect their software. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that there will be there will be no SaaS companies that don't adopt this narrative around in 10 years. Uh, it just, it be, it's becoming more and more interesting. Think about it this way. Envision was one of the hottest startups five years ago. But if you talk to any of the designers today, what product they want to use, they want to use Figma, right? And that's changed so rapidly. And why is Figma more vaunted than Envision? And I believe the reason for that is that Figma is built around collaboration and Envision isn't. Envision is, here's my thing I built. Look at it. It's great. Figma is like, help me build this thing. Give me input. Let me collaborate with you. And that's a game changer for the world and for the way software design is done. And everything else is going to be viewed the same way. Uh, VS Code, uh, Visual Studio Code is a common IDE for developers. And it's one of the most popular tools right now. The popularity that thing's getting is absurd. And the reason it's so popular is they have a collaboration in there that lets you, make, lets you code like it's Google Docs. And if you look at all the IDEs, um, integrated development environments that are being built, they all have the same virtual coding environments that allow me to collaborate with people. And if you don't adopt it, you're going to get, the world's going to eat you, right? You're not going to be around for very long. What about from like an architecture perspective? Like, so collaboration is one thing and you mentioned integrations. Um, one of the things that we do really well is kind of gluing the pieces together. There's all these different services out there. There's uh, internal systems, internal workflows, and not many people know how to put all this together because there's not really a common like language or common protocol that makes this simpler, maybe this is an opportunity to kind of standardize on a few things. Have you seen anything around that or is there a shift towards that or do you see an opportunity there? I think there's tons of opportunity to build what we, I call primitives or these building blocks that allow for collaboration to be the first thing to do on applications. Um, and I think a lot of people are gonna build libraries around it, gonna build services around it that allow you to do remote document sharing, to do uh, remote uh, server management, things like that. I think a lot of people are going to build that. And there'll be some enterprise products that get built that allow uh, and support larger companies also incorporating these into their products. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy. In Salesforce, how powerful it would be able to let two people edit an opportunity at the same time. 
How often were you alone on sales calls, Fahad, at your, at, uh, your previous jobs? Uh, not often, but I, I, I didn't like Salesforce, so I never was in. I tried to I'm, I'm using them as the big example, <laughs> but they, they don't. And that's why you don't like them. They don't allow you to collaborate with people. They allow you to yeah. approve other people's work. They allow you to see what people did, but they don't allow you to collaborate. So I think like, for example, CRMs, they make it disrupted, right? And with a collaborative uh, sales tool that actually helps you do your job with your team instead of pretending it does. I mean, that's some thoughts. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought because, I mean, collaboration, it could be chat, could be voice, but uh, what you're describing is more like workflow collaboration like you know the actual function of you know you're at an opportunity and how do you actually close it you know i i don't know i think i just see there's something there there's something interesting there oh yeah absolutely workflow is the most important thing and getting it right and then making it collaborative so everyone can participate because jobs everything's a team sport right so you might not realize it but it is and you want to be able to collaborate with your team yeah, so I think the next few months, uh, remote transformation is going to be the big topic, um, or at least from from our perspective. What other things are kind of on your radar exciting you uh, as we wrap up our conversation? Oh, there's so much stuff happening. In machine learning, the advances I've seen towards like virus analysis and stuff over the last month and a half is insane. And the evolution on how we look at biology Uh, is going to be maddeningly deep uh, by the time we get to a vaccine here with the amount of brain power put on helping uh, solve the COVID-19 crisis. um, That's going to be massive. Absolutely massive. I can't overstate that, or I hope I never understate that. It's going to move the world forward 10 years um, in that space. Not to be lost with self-driving cars have made good progress over the last uh, uh, Two or, two or three months because no one's been on the road. <laughs> They've been able to do a lot of research they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. A lot of good things coming from the cloud providers too. Um, that's really interesting. And remote working software and the open source software around that. There's like really good open source like Zoom alternatives and stuff that have really been advancing to support you know end-to-end encryption and things like that that are now in the common open source community and can be built around, which I think would be really interesting. So we're seeing tons of stuff happen um, because a lot of these developers are stuck at home and bored. Um, and I think there's going to be some really incredible innovations that come out of the next, we'll say three months, but we all know it's going to be longer. And it's it, just keeping up with it is hard enough, but staying apprised is the only way to stay. Like we're going to move forward, I think, a lot in the next next couple of months. Yeah, I just recently did a, a conversation with a four-star general, uh, Bob Brown, and I know people are struggling and I know it's hard, but one of the things he said about just leadership through a crisis that it's darkest before, uh, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, there are lots of opportunities as we go through this and, you know, just for people to hang in there. Uh, think about this remote culture and the things that we're talking about, uh, because I, I, I think it'll be for the better. Uh, we'll come out stronger. The interesting thing that, you know, I was always told in the crisis, you can't go wrong, is to uh, take care of each other and keep your honor. And uh, that phrase always meant something to me of like, you know, if you're taking care of each other and you're not doing anything malicious and you're doing the right things, then it's all going to work out. You know, the world isn't ending. Everyone wants to pretend it is, but humanity is going to live on. And it's going to—it's a dark time for sure. It's dark, and I don't even want to think about how bad it is out there. But at the same time, we're going to wake up tomorrow, and the world's still going to be spinning, and we're still going to be alive. And so you have to look at how can I improve the world and make the world a little better every day. And I think we do that by staying positive, by being leaders, by uh, not not compromising on what we believe in just because we're desperate or are hard times. I think this is when you get to define who you are. All right, Andrew, this was a great conversation. Uh, Thanks for uh, joining me. Thanks for listening. You can always connect with us at skiplist.com. 